first step is to make sure that you have uh, some sort of vision, whatever it is um, in your life. For example, those 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 people that you mentioned, right? There's a level of unfulfillment there when they are willing to say, for example, if they're willing to say, hey, I come from a broken family, therefore, here's my result. Or I come from, I failed at this, therefore, this. The story. Correct. The story and also what I call the reason. Because to have the reason, you have to give like justification for the reason. And the justification is usually the thing that's negative that is causing them to say, well, this is what happened to me and this is why there's an issue. So if that's what we agree on, then technically by default, we also agree that that thing is also where you feel a bit of, neg- uh, 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 you're, you're unhappy about it. It's a negative thing and you're unfulfilled. Mm-hmm. So if you're unfulfilled, there's always the opposite side. So I would say to that person, what's the opposite of this feeling? What, did, what would have had to happen for you to not feel this way anymore? They might say, well, you know, I shouldn't have. If, if, there's many ways they can answer it. They can say, well, what happened in the past shouldn't have happened. And then it'll be fine. Then I'll go, okay, let's say it didn't happen. What would you like it to be? And we start to draw up a picture of what the future is or what they want for themselves in the in the vision that they see is their version of the fulfilled world, mm-hmm. okay? And I would draw that up and get super clear on it. And then I'll go to them. Now you've got two options. You can go to it and find a way to use the story to help you to get there. Because so far what you've been doing is your method. Your method is this is the reason why I'm not getting there. In both stories, mm-hmm. the place you want to get to exists. Do you get what I mean? Morning, everyone. Welcome to the High Performance Management Podcast, episode 15. Today, I'm joined with a very special guest, one of my first mentors, coaches, who's gotten me to where I am now, Moses Marion, learner, speaker, mentor. Thanks so much for coming on, Moses. It means a lot. I really appreciate it. I'm always happy to connect with um, someone I've known in the past, become a friend. I'm happy to have a chat, man. Let's go for it. Yeah, let's do it. So, like I just said, Moses has been working with me since 2018. Back when, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I knew I wanted to do something. Um, I, I classify Moses as a top mindset professional. So I guess this episode, I really want to dive into, you know, a lot of environmental triggers for people, deep subconscious programming, real nerd mindset stuff that people would probably have to pay for normally to listen to. And anyone that's going to be listening is going to be like mind blow moments. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll dive straight in. Um, uh, give us a little bit about what you're doing, Moses, now, working with people. Yeah, so I mean, snapshot of my background is I used to be a real estate agent for about 14, 15 years um, in Western Australia. Um, that job was something that fell upon me in a sense that uh, my childhood, there was a few sort of challenges here and there with, you know, my fam- my mum and dad split up. I'm the oldest of four brothers, um, the oldest son. So there was a few responsibilities that came on a bit earlier than expected. So instead of going to university and finishing school, I went straight to work. It happened to be that that was the job I fell into because, um, you know, you don't really need a degree for it. Number one, so it was quick. You could make money uh, because it was commission-based. So I knew what I put in is what I get out. Um, but it was never a job by choice, meaning if I had the ultimate choice at that time, say, hey, what do you want to do in your life? It's not the thing I would have picked. It was more picked out of necessity rather than choice, okay? I didn't know that at the time because when, when you're that age, um, in that, you know, late teens, getting into young adulthood in the early twenties, your mind kind of doesn't know so much about the world. You're just going, well, obviously you need an income to live. It's about survival. It's about making ends meet. And that's the, that's like the context of where we were at the time. So I end up going to this job. I've always, the backstory on like my mindset is I've always had the best books, the best, um, teachings the best uh, guides or what we call digital mentors now, meaning I didn't pay for them, but they were existing through books or social media where, um, you know, no Instagram or YouTube back then when I was doing this, but I would still get it through books. So my mum used to give me all these books, which is Man in Babylon, you know, Robert Kiyosaki, all of the, all the famous guys, Napoleon Hill, all those books, Tony Robbins. And so I had a, re- a, a brief snapshot of that knowledge in my mind. It probably probably was quite unconscious, but I did know about those philosophies. So I applied that in real estate and I did really well there. Got to pretty much top of my game in that field. Um, but towards the end, it wasn't, there wasn't as much fulfillment there. Um, so then I ended up deciding to build this, which is where my 
if, if, if I had to choose a career and I had to choose something I'd like to do, I love learning, I love teaching and that constant growth of, you know, doing something new and experiencing something new. That's one of the things that existed in the real estate job, which is why I picked it. I knew that if I picked a job like that, I meet a different buyer, a different seller, a different day and a different property every time. It could never be the same kind of day. It wouldn't be a repeated job. And so that was fulfilled in that and, you know, it served its purpose for its time. But then now I just do, you know, work one-on-one -on -one with clients. I work with group clients. I help people with um, issues where they have had bad betrayals in their life or they've been blindsided by something and don't know how to get out of that or have been stuck in that for like three, five, ten years. And they've been telling themselves, you know, the that the cards they've been dealt, they believe are can't be changed. Um, it is, it's been set and they do have a mindset of wanting to take responsibility and get out of that position, but don't know how. That's where I work with those those people. Anyone that goes through a life crisis situation and a life crisis could be many things, whether you're a child or an adult, but you know, parents are splitting up something I went through, um, dealing with moving countries, dealing with a business partner that say rips you off, whatever it might be. If you have done gone through that, then a lot of times you can take on that story and then again, live a certain way based on that trauma or that incident, and then that's your life going forward. And unless someone wakes you up, or unless something happens to kind of change your mindset, you could technically go to the grave. And I use that word specifically because sometimes they don't know, or people don't know that's what they're doing. You know, an incident happens, you adapt a whole bunch of fears and a whole bunch of limitations based on that incident. You tell yourself a story that's negative, and then you set your future up based on that. And, and you take that to the grave, meaning you don't ever see outside of that potential ever again. So that to me is almost like a, it's like a death sentence while you're still alive because you are living within a, 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 a track which has been set to, set up for you by some external circumstance, okay? And you get to control it all the time. So that's where my focus is, is like work with people to help them move out of that and, and find the fulfillment and the happiness in what they want, but specifically the high-end type of uh, rare issues, you know, you might have someone that got, and I'll say this in, in terms of examples, you know, someone's living with someone else for more than 10 years but was married to you and you didn't know okay they had another family that sort of trauma uh you lost your family member in a car accident and you have to learn how to live again because one of your siblings has passed away you, you did a, a certain type of death where you've got you know for example let's say here yeah, i'll just use malaysia for example because the the plane that um went missing you know from malaysian airlines mh370 if someone goes through a trauma as an example like that where you know, you knew someone took a flight. You don't know what happened to it. You still don't know what happened to, to today. And there's trauma around that. You could live a certain way because of that fear. So it's how do I take people that have gone through that level of trauma and heal them and start fresh again? So that's what I kind of do mainly now. Um, and I do it while traveling the world, which is a good part. I've, I've found a way since COVID. COVID was a blessing. It allowed me to change my business from, you know, in-person to online forced me to learn a whole bunch of things that I didn't know about the online world. And I've been very, been very open and upfront on that. I, everyone who kind of knows me knows I'm pretty bad at tech and um, automation and all this online stuff because I was an agent, which is a face-to-face -face job with buyers and sellers. But I've learned that it was, I was forced to learn it because of the environment we were in. Um, and it's been the best blessing because now my income is a hundred percent online. Um, I, since I got married in late 21, I have you know, moved from Perth to the Gold Coast, from the Gold Coast to Penang. This year alone, I've been to Thailand, Singapore, back. I'm just traveling Asia and been running all my work from um, the online side of things. So that's been the blessing uh, from this sort of the business. Um, but yeah, that's my life. So it's teaching, learning, um, and at that, and, and, and all the time, like those are the things that kind of drive me. That's what I do. Mm. Awesome. Thanks for diving so deep. A few things uh, came up for me, you know, specifically yep. external circumstances shaping the way that we view the world and ultimately yep. the decisions we make and then the life we get. Yep. And that's yep. what you help people overcome or transmute and change those external circumstances. Yep. So I guess what are the consequences of these life events that have happened? And if they go unchecked, what are the consequences of someone's life and, and why? Why change them? Why do people, why would people want to change them or know to change them? Yeah. So I think, so we'll start from the basic level first. One is, um, you first have to know there is a, another, another path. 
Okay. And a lot of that comes to you by taking the first step of wanting or feeling that there is something more than where you are. Mm. A lot of times with clients that I work with, and I think I'll share this with you and you would relate to this with the work you're doing is even if someone comes in with um, an issue, whether it's a physical issue or a or mindset issue, they have to be willing to want to make the change or find something better. And then they, t- they seek out a professional like you or me to help them with that journey because they, they want it, but don't know how to get it. Um, if someone does not want it to me, then there's no point working on that because if they choose, once they've got all the information, they choose that they don't want to change, then that, that is where, um, personal responsibility comes in. So speaking specifically to those that do want the change is where this question can help and be answered is the way it starts is if, if those things go on check, for example, you just decide I'm aware there's something more, but I'm just going to settle for what I have now, Mm. then it is very unfulfilling. And you will build resent. And the resent is actually quite tricky how that happens. It could be resent on yourself for not being um, willing or having the courage or even taking the small baby steps to make the change because you know it's possible, but you're not doing it. So when you see other people getting certain things or healing themselves or finding a way out of a dark place or being successful in something, you will have either some hate or some resent build up. Hopefully it doesn't go too far because then you can become kind of a very nasty and, and, um, you know, you, your energy level will affect you in a sense that you're just unfulfilling with the world. And that's one of the worst things. A lot of the things that we see happening in the U S not mainly Australia, but in the U S with all the, the politics that is, that is going on there and all the say, for example, school shootings, and they look at the avatars of the people that are doing this, it's usually unfulfilled, undirected and people that have no clarity in life. So I'm not saying that's what would happen, but on the worst end of the spectrum, if you don't, um, look at what is meaningful to you mm. in your life you can then go down the other side and it doesn't matter how far you go being the worst and being so extreme and resentful to the planet that you do something that is not uh, wise, smart or beneficial to everyone. But even if you're not at the end, you're just heading that way. It's very unfulfilling. If you think about everything people do in their life, when they go get a job, work a nine to five or make some sort of income, they're doing it to earn money. And that money is then used to bring them ease, comfort and happiness and provide for their needs. Food, obviously you look at the basics, food, shelter, water. But after that, if you get a Netflix subscription or an Apple TV, or you buy some sweets or you go to the movies or whatever you do, it's to bring you some sort of fulfillment and happiness. Yeah. So ideally what you want to do is make sure that your life in all areas is trending that way and working towards something that way, meaningful and bringing you fulfillment, not just happiness, because that's a bit of a, a false goal you can't be happy all the time but you can definitely find fulfillment all the time whether you're feeling pain or pleasure mm. happiness or sadness if you're chasing something meaningful so to to go to your question about what happens if it's unchecked I've, I've answered that in the sense that you can go down a very negative path of resentment and feeling unfulfilled if you fix it and i know this because i can give you some some examples right so i come from a split family and i was 10 when that happened um i have witnessed domestic abuse right so if, if that's part of like if if i give you some of the things that have happened these are normally stats what they call the statistics that would make you kind of be unsuccessful i've gone through uh three different schools four different schools in three countries okay because of the way my when my parents broke up we moved from singapore to the us back to here so it's like you go from one system to another system to another system to another system so i never had the 12 years or a long uh standing time where i built friends from primary school to high school or to university and, and so I'm a high school dropout. I didn't go to university. So these are all the stats. You know, you got one, two, three, four, like it ends up. I have had the drugs and alcohol phase. So I know what that's like because, you know, when you're doing, when you're doing uh, something that you're not, it's fully meaningful to you, you can then trend towards doing what the crowds think is popular or, you know, you know, what they call hype and it's the hype at the time or it's what everyone does or it's all of that stuff. And so I have had, okay, well, that, that's another experience. If I let any of them be a reason why I can't get, you know, to like work towards something meaningful to me, then I'd be unsuccessful now, you know, and I'd be very unhappy because I'd fall into the groups of people that have allowed that in- issue of being, you know, a broken family to be, and I didn't have a, didn't have a degree to whatever it might be to give myself an excuse as to why my life is the way it is, but I'm not going to do that, which is, like I said, choice. I'm choosing to go, well, actually these things that have happened are blessings because I can use the learnings and the lessons from those incidents 
to allow me to write my own story. And if anything, those things actually have helped me help my clients more because I actually get them. I get if someone comes from a broken home, I know how to help them. If someone comes from a situation where they've got uh, a domestic violence issue in any of the uh, challenges or problems, I know how to help them. Mm. If they're not educated, if they failed, if they, you know, all of those things. So you've got to look at your storyline and go, okay, I've had a series of challenges. No one else has gone through what I've gone through. I have a lot of learnings that I get from that. How can I use these learnings to then better the planet and help others? Mm. And that's how I, and that's how it becomes, cause that's when it becomes meaningful to you. Mm. And when it becomes meaningful to you, like whatever path you choose, that's when, even if you feel pain or you feel struggle as you head towards that thing, you won't stop. Do you get what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, John Peterson talks about it as well. Like you've got to find the cross that you're willing to bear yeah, and then carry that cross. And I relate to that a lot. I think that is truly, if you needed to put a one sentence on it, like that's, that can explain so much. Even if you have a child, say you, you know, you're married, Corey, and the next phase comes up, you have a child. It's not all happy. It's not a fun. There's a lot of stuff that's painful. And you also have to know that when you do choose to go down that path, there's a chance that child might pass before you, which is one of the worst pains in the world. But at the same time, one of the best feelings in the world is when you realize that you as a couple have created this life and this is your son or daughter. So the be the thing is, everything we do has the worst pain imaginable on one end of the spectrum and the best pleasure possible on one end. Providing we find the meaning behind our journey, it's okay as we'll find a way to deal with it. That's really interesting. What, what would you say to the people that can't find meaning or have, or say those people that don't have the clarity, they are unfulfilled. They, yeah. they per perceive those statistics that, that you're mentioning and yeah. maybe unaware of other parts. Yeah. So the, the, the first step is to make sure that you have uh, some sort of vision, whatever it is um, in your life. For example, those, those, those people that you mentioned, right? There's a level of unfulfillment there when they are willing to say, for example, if they're willing to say, hey, I come from a broken family, therefore, here's my result. Or I come from, I failed at this, therefore, this. The story. So, correct. The story and also what I call the reason. Because to have the reason, you have to give like justification for the reason. And the justification is usually the thing that's negative that is causing them to say, well, this is what happened to me and this is why there's an issue. So if that's what we agree on, then technically by default, we also agree that that thing is also where you feel a bit of neg uh, 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 you're you're unhappy about it. It's a negative thing and you're unfulfilled. Mm -hmm. So if you're unfulfilled, there's always the opposite side. So I would say to that person, what's the opposite of this feeling? What, if, what would have had to happen for you to not feel this way anymore? They might say, well, you know, I shouldn't have, if, there's many ways they can answer it. They can say, well, what happened in the past shouldn't have happened and then it'll be fine. Then I'll go, okay, let's say it didn't happen. What would you like it to be? And we start to draw up a picture of what the future is or what they want for themselves in the, in the vision that they see is the our version of the fulfilled world. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I would draw that up and get super clear on it. And then I'll go to them. Now you got two options. You can go to it and find a way to use the story to help you to get there. Because so far what you've been doing is your method. Your method is, this is the reason why I'm not getting there. In both stories, mm -hmm. the place you want to get to exists. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. So. To get to that place, you need to find someone that has gone through a position where it's similar to you and found a way. And you can never say it's not happened because we've known in everything that you want to do in life, there's always someone that's done it and it exists. You need to find them, find out how they did it, and then model that. Now, you know, going into the detail of what if I can't find them? Well, I say look harder. You know, you will all now, especially now compared to say 50 years ago, it's easy to find. You don't even need to know the person. You can find the story somewhere online. You can find, you can search the stats in each country. You can go, okay, based on these, who are the people that have made it from here? They exist everywhere. And then go and study them. Then you can do two things. You can try, this is what I did is look at it, at who they are and learn from them and try to work towards that my, myself without help. The second level is to get help. This obviously comes down to affordability and where you are in life and what you can do. But if anything you pay for normally just shortens the process of getting there. Okay. So when I started, I couldn't pay for things. So I had to do it my way, which took me time, but that allowed me to learn the slow way. At that time, that was my level. Now, when I get to where I am now, 
every, um, and also this, this is levels, meaning every time I'm at this level, there's another level to get to. But now I'll always pay to get to the next level. I'll find a way to see okay, who's at that position that I want to be in, whether it's a business thing or say it's a fitness thing. And let's say you're, you know, you have an expertise, Corey. Let's just use me in you. You have an expertise definitely in the fitness world more than me in a lot of aspects and knowledge and science, right? And I want a specific result in one of those areas for my physical body. Well, I'll pay you to sh to help to get you to help me fast track that process to get there because you're the expert. Now, if, he, if I couldn't, I would go find everything that you've put online for free, every book that you've written, and still do it the best I can till that point mm -hmm. because you're still the expert. So that's what I would say to those people. It's just, it all comes down to taking action. It all comes down to also not selling yourself the story of why you can't have something. Start to look at how you can and then get help. That's the main thing. It's it's a very um, interesting subject that a lot of times people, you know, you can either do something alone or you can get help. And if you actually look at your life and measure your life, Every, most of the things you've been doing, you've always had help. You know, first it's your parents. When you first come into the world, humans are one of the only mammals on the planet. When, you know, you're born, you need parents. If you don't have your parents, you're dead, basically, right? Whereas so many other animals, it's like they have to survive from the minute that they're out there. So we don't. So we've been receiving help. So we have, you have to look at like that when every level of your life has the same thing. There's going to be someone that needs to support you. Mm. And there's going to be someone that challenges you. But at the same time, look for the help and then, you know, go through the process of trusted advisors, good friends. This is why that statement about the five people you hang out with is so important. A lot of people have, you know, said that thing in many different ways, whether it's, you know, the energy energies of the people or the value of the people and the money they have. I'm not looking at that depth of level. I'm just saying, make sure that the circle around you is trying to help you win and find meaning in your journey and helping you get there. They support your dreams and your vision. If they don't, you have to be very honest with yourself, whether they are, uh, have been your friend for 10 years or not, and I'm you know, hypothetically throwing numbers here, but you have to cut because they're the reasons that is literally energetically what's stopping you from going where you want. So you have to learn how to make those tough decisions uh, and do that. I don't, you know, everything for me, especially the last five, I'd say last five to seven years has been mentors. This is why it, it's become one of the things like the thing I am becoming myself is because, you know, I love to learn, I love to teach, but now I love mentoring as well. It's like the last piece I've added onto the work I do because I know that if I had some mentors 10 years ago, I would have grown so much faster. You know, it's mm. a very different level to what they do. My first mentor was one of my ages in my first real estate, obviously still my mentor to the day. He's still someone I talked to today and you when I was, you know, 19, 20. And every now and then, every three months, we'll have a call and just catch up. And he gives me insights that are so different from anybody else because of the knowledge and the skills that he has and the, what he built in his life at that time. Um, it's just insane. So there's value to, you know, investing time and money into your mind to get a result rather than, you know, into everything. Else. Yeah. And I think the faster people learn that, the faster they'll be able to kind of, um, go towards that meaningful thing that they want in their life. Yeah. I think um, there's a really deep underlying thing of awareness here. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you say mind and me and you know mind is one thing, but I definitely know on the early parts of my journey, learning about thoughts and beliefs and values, um, it was all so new and like it, it, it does, now I know it's an awareness. What, what what are some of those few things that maybe you can, I don't know, how, how can you teach awareness techniques for people that can start to tap into some of their thoughts and start to change that narrative that they've been telling themselves? Because it does begin with the awareness, right? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, awareness is a, you know, I've, I we've talked about this before in terms of you don't know what you don't know. So the, that part of awareness is always going to be, um, until something or someone crosses your path or someone says something to you that sparks the initial question, okay? So for you to be unhappy, for example, someone needs to say something or you need to see something with it on social media to be aware that you're unhappy. To me, that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. You're aware that you're unhappy because you're compared to something that you see on your phone or you compare it to some TV series that you're watching, right? Because the storyline on, say, any of the TV series that you watch or the movies that come out has a storyline that fits a certain narrative. 
about when you need to be married, for example, or you know, what type of boyfriend you need to have, or what type of money and bags you need to carry, or for girls, you know, what type of physical appearance needs to be affected. To me, that's called the awareness. You're technically aware of something because some information has, you know, come to you that makes you go, in comparison, I'm not happy. So when you realize that you're not fulfilled or you're not happy, right, there's the opposite side. Because it ha it's a judgment. When you have a judgment, it's judged against something. Mm. So when you say to me, okay, Moses, how can someone, like if they're not aware or how can they get techniques to be aware, I would say it's it's more, it's not, in, you don't really need the technique because it happens by default. What happens is you judge yourself against something. That's the awareness. And as soon as you feel unhappy, that's when the feeling of unhappiness comes up or unfulfillment. And as soon as that feeling comes up, you're now aware that there's something more better or something you want to aim to or something's not right. And that's where you need to then go and go, okay, what is the thing that needs to happen for me to be happy or fulfilled? And then I check two filters on that, whatever you end up saying. So for example, it is, say, say someone says, oh, I'm not happy because I am on uh, 75K a year and I need to be 150 because my friends are on that. They have better bags, cars and houses, whatever it might be. As soon as you say that's the that's the thing I'm judging to, that's what I want you to go, is this an internal thing or an external thing? Is this me wanting it or is it based on an external thing? Meaning because of all these things outside of me, I now want to have what they have. Mm. Once you realize that, then you need to write your list down and go, okay, how much of my life is based on external factors and external people setting standards on me versus internal? Mm. And be truthful about it. Mm. Then you, you know, for me, what I do is I look at what's an internal one and I only aim for my internal ones. I'm not worried about whether someone else who's my age, um, you know, I got to be there because for example, um, you know, there's, there would be another 30 to 35, 35, anyone in their thirties that might be, you know, multi-millionaire by, I think there's a guy in Australia right now, I think he's 33, Adrian Patelli. I don't know if you've heard of him, the guy that does the card giveaways, he's got like 600 million in revenue, I think right now. So you can judge yourself. Yeah. Well, wow, man, I'm not happy because he's the one with the McLaren in the unit, right? Well, that, yeah. That. Yeah. So he, you know, and right. it's a business. Yeah. It's a business that's, you know, to me that when I look at that, it's respect because it's like he was working on something for a long period of time, and there was what we would call no results to the world. Society looks at it as no results, hmm. but all of a sudden he finds a way to mm -hmm. work within the Australian system to get his business legally create a brand where he has, you know, brought in a, a market that loves the percentage. Like it's like the lotto, right? You're going to win something. It's, it's something that happens almost all the time. He's increased the frequency of his giveaways. He's built a brand and he's changing, you know, there's an aspect of charity. There's an aspect of changing people's lives. There's an aspect of someone getting something of high value, whether it's a guy, girl or whatever, and how to market himself with very low overheads, very little staff. So when I look at that, a lot of people can compare and just go, well, he's lucky, you know, or he found a summer loophole and that's just a fluke. It's not like that because he's been trying to, his thing is he's had in his mind, he's always imagined doing something and having something. So he's been doing it and working it a certain way till he gets it. How he gets there is irrelevant and how long he took to get there is irrelevant. The truth is he actually stayed on the path for the entire time. Yeah. So. In his awareness, like he, if you listen to one of his podcasts, he said, for example, I was driving my Nissan Micra, imagining I was in my Lambo every single time I went to the gym. That's, he's in the Lambo, but he's in the Micra. He had to do that for, you know, year after year after year. And of course the car may have changed, but in the gap between working on all his stuff to when it finally hit in the last two or three years, he's still imagining what's happening now that entire time. Yeah. 10 years to become overnight success. Yeah. And so I, this is where, you know, say I was younger, um, when I was in real estate, you know, early twenties, I would have been like, that's so lucky. And it, I wouldn't even know that I'm saying that as a judgment, it would be like the automatic statement that comes up. But now I assess things cause I'm aware of how hard it is to build something, you know, and, and we don't know what he has gone through. And a lot of people are going to judge when you have super success like that. That's part of the game. All right. But if it's meaningful to him, it's why it worked. There's another billionaire that was speaking to uh, um, this this lady that was listening to, and she he said, he's on the plane, and he said to her, um, she goes, how are you a billionaire? Like, what's the one secret? What's the one thing to why you, you got what you got? And he said, it's literally staying on one thing 
for for this long, and he he was working on his one business for sixty one years at the time. He goes sixty one years on the one business. Mm. He goes, imagine the compound effect of the effort towards that one vehicle that I built. He goes, in current generation now, the current world right now with TikTok and all this stuff, the attention to stay on one thing is it. They he goes, they can't even compete, which is why they don't get there. But if you said they on that one thing, which is also the same thing as Charlie Munger. Ron Buffett, they have their stories of how they get this. Like they literally just follow one thing the whole time and stay like his formula to the stock market is very simple, but no one follows it for 50 years. Do you get what I mean? Mm. So that's, that's all of this ties into that same thing. But in your awareness, when I related to me seeing someone else do that, it's judgment. So be aware that you're comparing to something, then go like, when I look at that, I don't go, oh, now I need to have all that. Then I'm successful. I go, okay. That's, that's his journey. What's my journey? What's meaningful to me? Is it also 10 cars and is it 600 million? It's not. It might change in time, but right now it's more about freedom. To me, I think the best currency in the world right now is freedom. Freedom to do what you want, freedom to eat what you want, freedom to do what you want in terms of travel. And that was the biggest thing challenged over the last three years. So I think that is the most important currency in the world right now, not money, because millions of people had money um, recently, but couldn't do anything with that money because of rules. Okay. So I think when we look at it, um, make sure when you're bringing into awareness, what you want, make sure it's in internal thing. Cause for example, let's say it's external. You might go, well, you know, there's all these rules, but I want to travel. So I'm going to do certain things that authorities put on me because I got to fit in with what everyone else is doing. And I want to feel, you know, I want to have a quick fix to something. So it's externally trying to keep your life a certain way to meet external expectations. Whereas internally, if you have a truth or you have a, a meaningful and purposeful goal to something and you want that to be the thing that matters, then you will find that you don't really care about the outside world. You just do what's true to you. And because it's meaningful to you, even though there is suffering, for example, you can't do certain things or you're restricted in a certain way, it isn't really suffering. It's actually more, it's actually more rewarding because in the long term, which is by the way, a billionaire's game, long term you win. How do you have the ability to be a billionaire? How do you have the ability to get to a certain goal? They literally say, you know, get over short-term gratification. Mm. You know, can can you do that? Literally, if you can do that, that's like one skill I'd say to someone. One skill you want to master, get that. I've been, I've been trying to practice that daily. Like every time I feel like I want something earlier than I think, I'm like, okay, you know what? Why? Why does it need to be now? Can I do it that somewhere else? And this is like business, you know, do I invest? If I, if I make a certain amount, do I invest that in a stock or do I put that into a reinvestment of like Gary Vaynerchuk and he put it back into his business, back into his business, back into his business, or do I go buy that special car, right? So short-term gratification versus long-term gain. Um, so yeah, in, in closing off that question about awareness, the awareness comes from the judgment. When you judgment, when you do the judgment and you compare, that is the awareness that you have to know that you're not comparing to something and you're unfulfilled. Once you have confirmation, you are unfulfilled, then measure it against the, inter the internal or external things. Is it externally something that's driving you to feeling mm -hmm. that or is it internal? And set the goals from an internal point of view. Now that's also easier said than done, but we can go into that a bit later if you'd like. Comes back to the clear vision, you know, having a vision board. And I mean like super clarity on it, going really deep on it. Uh, we have a mutual friend that we know have brought him through that process. You have to go through it to a level where you're like measuring your life out till the day you pass to what your legacy is. You have to measure, like really set up what you want for your life, imagining that you went through a near death experience because a lot of people actually set their real goals when they nearly died one day, they had a heart attack or they were in a car accident, they just survived and then they go, what am I doing? And they suddenly have this massive change, like everything stops and they set this new thing because they go, actually, my mortality is very real. I actually can die. And am I doing what I want or not? Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So that's okay. really interesting. Sorry, just while it's here, I don't mean to cut yeah. you off. No problem. Why, why is it that we make those decisions in the near death moments when really you can make change at any point freely? Like, why? Uh, like, conf comfort, fear of what other people think, security. It's what we've been trained to do because of school and education and jobs. You know, the, 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 the average person thinks that, you know, I, I got a beast mark to make a certain amount of money to be able to pay the bills. And then what I have left over is how I have fun. And if, if, if as soon as the income gets shaky or you feel you lose a job, that's like your life force. 
it's the equivalent of what would have been food in the caveman days. You know, if you don't have food, well, you die, right? So in the same way, if you don't have income, you die. So they'll do whatever needs to be done to just provide an income. And a lot of times, if you want to go start a business or build something yourself and not be an employee, be a boss, you have to forego some income or some, some comfort in life to take that risk, okay? And that risk is why people don't do it because they feel like, oh no, you know, if I do that, what if I fail, which is a fear of failure. Two, what if it looks really bad to everyone else? You know, for example, we, we're now on a podcast You know, it takes a while to start a podcast and put something out because you might look like a clown the first day and then you get better and then, or you might talk about something and, you know, you might get hateful comments, but you're doing it. And, you know, it's like, you have to be willing to look like shit for a few years before you're yeah. good. And that's going to happen publicly. So that's the reason why and you know you're trained so long even as a child at school you put your hand up you know do you want to answer the question if you get it right great if you get it wrong oh move we'll on to the next person so you're also like trained not to have a go because of the public rejection okay so that's my my quick answer to it i probably it can go really deep into that but it is really fear of failure fear of what other people see and how they judge you and usually it's people close to you you'll be like mom dad a specific friend yeah. Um, and you just need to not care about that. Now, again, easier said than done, but this is where you get help or you go train yourself and go, okay, how did someone else yeah. get past that? Um, because otherwise what happens is, like I said, a near death experience forces you to, because at that yeah. point, when you realize that you were about to die and that was goodbye, you actually don't care about, you know, the neighbor or your mom or your best friend from primary school that says, oh, you know, what are you doing with that? That's weird. Is that going to work? You go, well, I, was, I nearly died, dude. So I want to make, you know, I want to run, a, I want to make a shirt business. So I'm going to do that. I don't care what happens. If it fails, it fails. At least I gave it a go because I got one life. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I really like that. And uh, another thing that came up during our conversation then, the journey of finding meaning. Because it's yeah. not as clear cut as like just meaning, you know, like it, it is a journey mm -hmm. finding what you don't like, finding what you do like, fine tuning yep. that with, with a vision. What's a... Yep process that the listeners can apply to their own life. Maybe, maybe they, they hear that, they, they hear meaning and they, they have absolutely no connection to it. They go, Got it. I'm just, I'm just, I have to, I'm in survival. I'm just going to pay for my bills. Like I don't have time to think about meaning or they might. Well, that when, when they're paying for their bills that at that point, that is actually the meaning. They are, they are, they are meaning to their, to what they're doing at that time is survival and you know if they have kids then even more so the actually reason you're doing all the safe stuff is to make sure the kids have food on the table mm. so speaking from from that let's just assume that they go I, okay i gotta find meaning in my life and find something that is something i can chase and then whether there's pain or pleasure i'm still willing to do it right mm. so you can relate it to kids a lot of people they do that when it's their child doesn't matter how painful it is they're gonna do it if my child's in a burning building and i'm gonna get uh, burned as i save them i'm gonna do it so you need to do this for you first. A lot of times you apply it only to your kids. This is to parents, you know, you find a way to somehow find meaning behind that because the child is important to you. Keyword being the child is a priority to you. So now take that priority and go, okay, if that is a priority to me, my child, let's pretend that there's a new world. It's just the person, this avatar we're talking about that's sitting at home. What is meaningful to you? Change the word and go, what is important to me? Change that word and go, what's a priority to me in my life right now? And mm -hmm. list your top 10 priorities. That's so, right. and you can't involve other people. So to you, meaning if you had kids, you can't say my number one priority is my son. I agree with that and I get that. But for the purpose of this exercise to really filter out what's important to you outside of external things, meaning your soul, you and the planet and what you want, you have to play the game and answer the questions this way. And then you can add that later, you know, and it'll fall into the right spot, but it would be okay to Moses. What's the most important thing when everything else, you know, everything else aside, I'm sitting over law. What is the most important things to me in a, in order of priority, learning, teaching, mentoring. It's in my top three. So if I don't build my life around that, it means I don't have meaning. If I take those three things away and I now go to a job, that's an agent. And, you know, do all, everything else where I'm not allowed to do those three things and just let the list build up, whether it's movies, picnics, driving, like I might have fun driving a car. I might have fun going to the movie, but I have no meaning. That's where I'm fulfillment builds. So many people go, live in that. That's the thing. Yes. And that is exactly the thing. But, you know, you, by the way, you live in it 
you can it be, when you do something long enough, it becomes a lifestyle. When you when you do it as a lifestyle, it becomes well, this is just what's meant to be. People even live that. Yeah, that's just how it is. Just is what it is. Uh, yeah, live the dream. <laughs> such is life. Um, you know they so, and then you don't even know you stop. You don't even know that's where it is. And you know sometimes that ignorance is a blessing because if you don't know, then fine. But I, like the awareness question we came back to. If you're aware that you're unhappy and you keep saying that to yourselves and that's what you feel, then you probably need to go do something because to be unhappy and to have that awareness that you're not fulfilled, you're judging something in yourself against something else. And that thing is this thing that you really want, this thing that you think you're big enough for. Like you're, you've been building um, a, a journey towards something that you want. It's a vision that you have. I obviously know a little bit of the vision that you have. That is meaningful to you, which is why, regardless of whether there's a pain or a pleasure or up or a down or a, a, a longer goal or a shorter goal, or as as obstacles come up to you, you're on that path. Do you get what yeah. I mean? If it's not yeah. meaningful, let's say your goal is to, I don't know, go on a yacht. Well, you'd stop if there was enough pain because it's not meaningful. I'll just go down to Hillary's boat harbor, mate. <laughs> hey, just stand on a yacht. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know. That's why I think, so you ask the question, what do they do? Well, what's important to you, your priority value, and in what priority order? Then when you have that list, see if your life actually demonstrates that. Because if it doesn't, you need to put in steps to implement that plan. Like literally put that into place. Then you'll start to find meaning. There's so many things that you already do now. Most people are already doing things where whether it's um, painful or not, you know, whether it's a struggle or not, they still do it because it's meaningful and important and they value it. My example is basketball, right? It's one of the sport things that I value. It doesn't matter if I have a twisted ankle, I'm still playing. You can watch, you know, players in the NBA. There's ones that are playing because they get big paychecks, but there's ones that are playing because they love that game. It's important and it's passion, which means when they're injured, they're still on the court. They don't take those days off. Yeah. And there's a very clear difference between the two. The ones that do really well that are the superstars, they find meaning in this game and meaning it means something to them. It's important to them. Yeah. It's bigger than almost anything, which is why whether they're struggling, whether the back's out, they're playing. Whereas the guy that's there because he's super talented, but you know, it's a paycheck and it became a lifestyle and they became the girls after the first two years and they've made millions of dollars before they put any effort in. You know, they're waiting for, you know, I can use a niggle to take the, the game off. Right? Yeah. So, so this is how you know. So you the, the average person out there needs to go, okay, what in my life am I, like whether I'm sick, you know, whether I've had a bad day, whether someone upset me, whether I'm tired, there's some things that I just will do no matter how much I'm feeling like I don't, you know, I just love it. So I do it for me and you, I think it's gym. Like I could be really, you know, I, I, it's a life, it's something I love now. I, if I don't go, I feel worse. You know what I mean? I want to go. So that's now meaningful to me because health is important to me. So I do it regardless of whether it's rain or, you know, whatever it is out there. So the, uh, everyone else listening doesn't need to look at, you know, is it gym for me or is it basketball or so Just go, what is it that you would do, whether you're struggling or not struggling, whether you had the money, you didn't have the money, or whether you, you know, what what do you do that you just are driven to do through natural instinct and just as something you love to do? And then work out how that can be something that you develop on and build. I've got a really good one, good question to ask because there's a few of the people that in my life that I you know, quasi mentor and have conversations. Yeah. What about those people that, that know that there's that thing they would love to do, but they don't want to start it because they think that doing, starting or turning something into like a career or a job is going to, you know, take away from what they love. To me, as a coach, it sounds mm -hmm. like, a protective mechanism, mm -hmm. you know, they, they don't want to do it because it will turn into a chore. What, what would you say to people like that? They, they know that they, they, they're kind of okay with what they're doing, but there's like a thing in the back of their mind. that's like, ah, oh, something could be a bit more. And I know I love this thing here, but it's like, I'm kind of comfortable where I'm at. It's all right. But you know what I mean? Like, what would you say to those people? I, I, for me, it's very simple. It just means you don't want it enough. So it's obviously not as important. It ends there. There's nothing else to say. Like, um, you know, there's a, a few controversial people online that have similar statements and I, I vouch for them and I agree with these statements where sometimes you don't do something because the pain isn't painful enough. So, you know, you, you like to talk about the problem, 
being like, this is why, you know, uh, for example, let's say I have a, I am fat and I have, I want a six pack. This is me personally. Okay. I want it. And I keep saying, oh, it'd be so nice if I had a faster metabolism, if I had a right support or blah, blah, blah. To be honest, I, you know, if I met Mark, that version of myself, I'd just be like, you obviously don't mind it that much. You don't mind the weight that much. You don't want the six pack as much. So stop bitching about it and just admit that you're happy with what you have now. Mm. If you really didn't like that, the weight or the look or the physique, the pain and that discomfort would be enough to get you to go to start solving it. So it just means it's not painful enough. So maybe you need to get a bit more fatter and a little and feel more pain and then you might fix it. And then I just leave because I, I don't have time for people to, that find weak excuses. And this is speaking more like if you want results, right? A lot of the, all the clients I work with, it's a very simple question I have for all of them is, you know, are you willing to be open and upfront? Are you willing to have direct conversations and are you willing to deal with any of the reasons or stories you tell yourself head on? without being offended, all right? Is that okay? Meaning you're happy for that regardless of how offensive it might be. If they say yes, all of them have results. If they say no, they're using the potential offensive conversation and that narrative to escape the problem, okay? Mm. So I don't have, I, I, me personally, I don't have, like I really think that um, two things, you either don't want it enough or the pain is not enough. So yeah. one of them needs to happen more. Usually the pain is what drives people. As you know, Tony Robbins talks about this as well. Yeah. If it's painful enough, you'll get the system, the, the thing done. But if you're on the other side where it's not painful enough, you just want the six pack, but you're not, you know, really unhealthy and bad. And, and, and by the way, you don't need a six pack to be healthy, right? So it's not, it's like a luxury. You could be a, a decent physique, um, without being overweight or obese and you're fine. But having that six pack might be like, oh, like a luxury. So you need to want it. It needs to be something you really want, then you'll work with it. Otherwise, you, you like to talk about the things you want. And Patrick that David says this, he's a guy that I, I follow and uh, he thinks he's quite wise with some of his statements. He said, the most dangerous people in the world to have around you are ambitious people. In other words, people that have all these things that you talk about, like I want this and I want that and this would be so good, but, but, but. Ambitious people who are, keyword, lazy. They are the most dangerous people because they are the ones that know they actually do have the talent and the skill and the ability to get the thing, which is whatever they said they want to do. These guys that you talk about, they know they can, but they're just not willing to do the work. They're lazy. So when someone does the work, that's not as talented as them, but is willing to do the work and he doesn't have that lazy trait. It drives them crazy. They can. I mean, they'll they'll sell. Oh, I like this conversation. And and so what what about the people that are lazy, I'm speaking from a recovering lazy person, right? Like I, I definitely, uh, I think I I relied on my like quick wittedness and quick, like fast learning ability. And I kind of floated through like school and somehow passed and like, yep, that's something I'm working on. And I I think I'm definitely better at taking action. Like I, at least I've created something now it's taken a lot longer, but I don't quit. Right. But yep. let's say there there's people who are like who are like these lazy, ambitious people. Like yeah. I know that there, there there's ambition inside of them. There is means for a vision and, and, and drive. They can change, right? Yep. What what would be some things that mindset wise that you would have to deconstruct their beliefs around so that they could move into that person? Because they might have something that's gonna change the world, right? Yes. Um, that they, so this, that's sadly, uh, that is, you know, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. You've heard that statement. Mm. The action comes from the person, you know, you can teach everything you want to teach. And it is true. That's why these actual long-term statements exist in the world that, you know, Les Brown said this, the graveyard is the worst place because there's so many dreams that died there. Yeah. There's so many things that could have changed the world that died there. That is one of the most famous quotes because it is a sad truth of the planet. There are some people that just will not do that. They don't take the action. And yes, they could be a person that maybe manages to finally get them to, you know, wake up. But you're talking like, it means like someone like me or you would have to commit our entire life to trying to get them to become yeah. the best version of themselves. Make a part but of it. But if we, but if, yeah, but if we do that, 
we might miss out on helping a hundred other people that are willing to change. Yeah. So it doesn't work that way. And this is the same thing where I talked about, you know, as beautiful as the world is, it's also as dark as it can get. And it's as sad as it can get. And it's a disappointing. So this is one where you, you know, you might look at that and say, man, that's really tough. Like if that's the way it is, where we're just agreeing that some people could have something that could change the world, but they're not willing to do the work. I say, yes, that's, but that's also the reason why. Yeah. Yeah. But that's also the reason why that story on its own, which is they are people that are am like super ambitious and talented, but lazy that didn't make the thing work. Some guy that will be born and he'll listen to that and go, well, that ain't me. And the drive in him to go not be that person is as strong as when he heard that story. That story is what makes him go and change the world. So you need that story to also create this other person. That is the person that says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be someone that wastes my life because he's comparing it to that thing, which is sad. Like he said, okay. So you need, it's like, it's like, you know, right now there's a movie out, um, sound of freedom came out independence in July 4th or 5th. Um, I think fifth for us down here, but it was released. It was not, uh, marketed by mainstream media. It was not supported by Hollywood. It's a movie about child sex trafficking. It's a dark, dark part of the world. It's something that uh, Tony Robbins is the one that was funding it along with a whole bunch of other people that are. Not the one with Mel Gibson? Yeah, correct. Oh, I didn't know that was out. I've got to watch it. It's out, yeah. So, you know, he, that, that is about something that happens on the planet, which is child sex trafficking. Um, um, everyone knows about it. It's, it's in, it's in all the official documents in governments around the world. The numbers are insane. Everyone's known about this. Mm. The things they do with the kids known about, but people will you know, claim it to be a conspiracy. Now it's become fact. It's, uh, it's known by more and more people. People are speaking about it, but as dark as it is, it's because of that story. It will spark this entire movie that's going out now in the last literally seven days last week is going to create a whole bunch of people that are the drivers of making that change to bring that pendulum swing back because they need to know how dark it is to actually fix it. If you don't, if you're not aware of it, it doesn't happen. You know what I mean? So the, the you know, I'm, I've got a uh, video that I'm making on it because I, I haven't put it out yet, but I've been, I had to really study it and go, okay, how can I, you know, talk about this in a way that it is understood by my audience and understood by, uh, people in business, because I have, I have a business aspect to it. I look at it from the point of view where, uh, if you are a cocaine, if you're Pablo Escobar, so, you know, Narcos is a series I watched and you ever, you're any drug dealer, when you sell the drug, you buy it for a cost and you sell the drug for a cost and you get the profit illegally, right? Child sex trafficking is you get the child being the product, same as the, the cocaine is the product, but you can rinse and repeat the selling. That's the difference. So it has taken over the drug trade, mm. the child sex trade. Now, if you imagine that it's dark because yeah. you're talking about, you know, someone under 10 or 12 being used in a bedroom 10 or 12 times a day. And the person has a one-off cost with ultimate profit. Now, the reason this is dangerous is because in the digital world, the world that me and you work in, which is courses, perhaps, and programs, you know, if I run a furniture store and I buy a bunch of furniture, I'm going to buy the furniture, hold it, have overhead, sell it, make the profit. If I'm selling something digital, I make it once I can sell it a hundred times. Now, if you, and if, if the drug dealers have worked out the digital concept with children, it's very dangerous, which is what's happening, which is why it's become the one. So, you know, I'm going to, I have. Plans like this is one of the things that I want to add to my give back when I'm building my business. Is like, how can I play a part in helping that? Yeah. Okay. Because we we're not a Tony Robbins right now, but it doesn't matter how small you you play as long as you play a meaningful game. So this matters for me. It's like one of the things that does matter. Yeah. A lot so of I, I, yeah, I'm looking at it and I'm going, you know, it's not something that's supported. Um, but going back to what we talk about, where sometimes the dark thing or the sad thing, like you say, people. The comparison I want to just confirm is the people that are, like you say, that you, you're saying it's sad that they, you know, they have something, but they're just not willing to get out of that. They have to exist. Okay. Their dark has to exist or the sadness has to exist for the other side to then become what it becomes and create the happiness on the other side or create a change on the other side. Uh, Yenomi Park, the skate North Korea has to exist yeah. and tell a story for people to go, we need to make that change. Yeah. If you didn't hear about it, you wouldn't want to make the change because you don't even know it happens. Right. Yeah. 
So I think that's that's my answer to that. I I'm a bit more cold in that sense. It's like, I'm sorry, but you just don't want it enough. That's my first answer. Or you're not in pain enough. Second answer: If you want a result, then you need to accept one of those is true. Which one is it going to be? And then, are you going to listen to the action steps therefore after? That's why Corey, by the way, what I do with my work now is the the thing I built now, which is what I do the most work on, is I do the five three to five month work with people as a mentor, because I am actually implementing the thing that they're not doing for them over that time. Like man's the person that's on their shoulder doing it the whole time. Because otherwise you don't do it. Most people don't do it. They just become lazy or they can't do it. We know this from self-development. Most people go to self-development course and they never do anything with the stuff they learned. They pumped up for that week, but until they get to the next course, nothing happened. Mm-hmm. So I've gone, that's a gap in the market. If I can go to the market and say, have you been to a course? You got some results very close to the course or very close to the event. But then there's this massive gap where nothing happens until the next event or the next course or the next. And they're like, yeah, okay, cool. Well, in that gap, imagine if you were getting results like as if you were in the course every week. Oh, it'd be so good. Well, then that's why you need to look at maybe working that way because that's what I focus on. Crazy enough as it sounds, accountability is free. You can do it to yourself, right? Mm. But it's one of the things that I get my most of my business from is because I am the accountability partner in the relationship. And yeah. even though people know they don't need me for it, they actually do. That's the weird thing. That's the paradox. It's like, well, I let's just stop. Go do it yourself. Then I call them in two months. They haven't done it. It's like, okay, well, you can't do it yourself. So you need accountability. Yeah. Now go find five good friends and all of you go on the same path. Then you don't need me. Go do it. Then they that can't do it. Okay, well, then you need to pay for the network, right? Let's do it. So this is how it works. Like I know, I know that... Um, they, you know, billionaires and millionaires, like they all have a, a very good network. The reason they have the network is they help each other grow. And sometimes you, it's called pay to play. You got to pay to start to know those people. If I want to, if I want to meet, like, say me and you want to go go do a podcast with, I don't know, a John Bees, right? We we might have to pay for that because he's at a level that's high and it accesses a network. We can't say, oh, that's unfair. Why did why are they just ripping people off? Or you know, he doesn't need the money. It's not about that. It's about the time that they have to who they can give, right? And so you have to pay to play. Um, so again, with these guys, you know, ambitious but lazy or can't get a goal, it's like, if you really want to change the world, I would argue that if they really think it's going to help humanity, this thing that they have, and they're not willing to go make the change, maybe the thing is they talk a big game, but the thing isn't going to change the world. They haven't really been willing to work on it. And they actually prefer just let the talent pass by. Mm. It's just the sad truth. And you might have to tell them that directly to their face and see if it wakes them up. A good friend will do that. You know, mm. I, I know that like my first mentor, he was very direct with me. Like, this is why I'm kind of, I, I'm good at what I do now, because I know that actually the direct method is the best method. Yeah. Just stop beating around the bush, do you know what I mean? Like it's, well, why, why haven't you got the, like for whatever the goal is, just client. Say you have a client. Okay. Well, what do you want? I want this. Why aren't you there yet? And then all the excuses come up. Well, let's, so if we solve all the excuses. Will you get it? And if it's if they gave you the truth, then yes, you'll get it. So then we go, okay, let's just set that plan up and fix it. But most times what happens- That's really powerful. Is, yeah, mo- and and most times those reasons they gave are what we call the, the, the surface level reasons. Usually I'll find like within a week or so, there'll be a real reason that comes up. And it's always something to do with a fear, a fear of judgment, a fear of failure. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, just even talking about it. Yep. What, what, what if those people, yeah, they just got fear, you know? Yep. It's, and then you've got to fix the fear. I mean, the yes. fear is fixable. Um, they, this is a, a a potential point that may be argued by people who listen to this, but in general, like they know that through science, there's only really, you know, one, two, maybe three fears you're born with, right? That's the facts. Fear of falling, I think was one of them. There's another fear. I can't remember what it is, but there's like two or three, or maybe even yeah, two. Yeah, falling, choking, I think. Yeah, something. There's like there's this that like inbuilt fear which you're born with, right? Everything else is learnt. Yeah. So you can unlearn it. The simple. So you, to me, the once you know that, your excuse is out the door. You know, and it's less it's all learning and unlearning. Well, you know, so you know about time. Timeline is one of the techniques to release fear, which I I can do. I do. That's one of the things I work with clients. Another one is um, getting very close to the fear. One is, you know, practice gets rid of the fear. There's many, so 
a simple Google search will show you how to get rid of a fear. Same concept like we spoke about at the start of this podcast. You can, everything right now is doable because of the way the world is with YouTube and free education. Everything, pretty much like, I would say 95% of things. How do, how do I get rid of a fear? You can type that into YouTube or Rumble or anywhere. And there's a whole bunch of experts that will show you specific things you can do to get rid of it. So if someone comes to me and says to me, oh, you know, how do I, I'll go, have you done every single thing that you could get for free yet? If they say no, well, then it's no point talking. If they say I have done, I'll say, show me proof. Who are the names that you went and looked at? And what are the things they said to do? And show me and tell me when you did them. Mm -hmm. And if they still couldn't solve it, then I would say that now you need to pay someone to professionally help you do it. I'm only giving this advice based on the fact that this is to do it where it's not going to cost you something. But my obvious answer would be find the best person around you that has been known to help people get rid of your specific fear, pay for it and solve it. Because every day you go not solving is costing you something. Mm. If you have a phobia about snakes and you live in Australia and you want to live in the country because maybe you want to retire there, you're going to have to go see a specialist that knows how to release the phobia of snakes. Yes or no? So if you choose not to, well, that means you're knowingly going to go into a retirement place where somewhere in the country because you want that. But live in fear. To me, that is pretty stupid. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Pay the twelve hundred or fifteen hundred or two grand or five thousand for a specialist therapist to work on that. Don't go to a clown. Go to someone that's got proof of the results. They'll put it on there. You can see the past clients. Go do that. That's how I look at it. Um, otherwise, you might ever never retire there. And let's say your dream was to be some um, country town with a massive block with acres of land, and you work to it. But this one tiny fear doesn't let you fulfill that. That sounds pretty messy. Like that sounds something worth fixing. So the fear, whatever it is, unless it's an inbuilt by birth fear, and I can quickly check. I mean, um, what fears are we born with? I, I swear it was one or two things. There we go. We are born with only two innate fears, the fear of falling and the fear of loud sounds, like suddenly bound. Okay. Uh, now, by the way, this is Google, not sure if it's 100% accurate, but for the people listening, it's not about whether this is 100% accurate. The fact is, let's just say for argument's sake, you're born with five born fears or one or three. Let's not argue the number. Let's just assume it's under five or under two. Mm. That means though, by default, everything plus that is made up by your experience. Yes mm. or no? Okay. Yeah. So now what are we going to do? We're going to go to a point where, okay, go list those fears out, right? And mm. fix them. The faster you fix them, the faster you will grow. So I have always had a fear of listening to my own voice on camera, looking at my own face on a video. Anything public is not me because I'm introverted, right? I have to get past that, which happened a while ago. But if you, if you, if anyone knows me or sees me from knew me from when I was, you know, a kid, they would not say this is what I would do. It's like no, not even a chance, okay? Because mm. I worked on it, and let me tell you, it's not easy to work on it but you work on it, it does solve because it never existed in the first place. I know. Yeah. Over five years. Even, so, yeah. even me yeah. and you had this. I had this conversation with you in like 20, what, 19? Yeah. About me trying to post online. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, see, I, I, may, I may not remember the full conversation, but I know we have had conversations where, you know, even now speaking to you directly, I think oh, a lot of the stuff that's, happening with you is it's just a few levels it's so many things are just going to blow up and grow as soon as you just go you know okay just doing it like night is night and slope just do it doesn't matter you're doing it now with podcast which is great this is and now you're 15 or whatever the number was i heard yeah that there's a reason that happens because you're just willing to do it you know you yeah. break through the fear and you do it and you i'm not getting paid for it or whatever you say that's irrelevant because Homozzi wasn't paid for his for the yeah. first one, two years. He said no one really listened to it until I think after a hundred and something episodes. And he already was a hundred million dollar man. Yeah. So if a hundred million dollar man's putting up podcasts that no one's listening to, you see, when I look at comparisons, I'm like, it's a separate journey. It really doesn't matter. If as long as I know it's meaningful to you, because if you yeah. have fears about this and you're doing it and you've got obviously the image behind you, you got the books behind you, you got the, you know, I know people can tell, hey, this is what's meaningful to him. You know, philosophy, mindset, mind and body connection, timeless principles. Like if that's the thing, that's why you're willing to do it and talk about it and go through it. Yeah. No, it's, it's, yeah, I do enjoy it. It is fun. And yeah, yeah I feel like we, we've, 
gone and I oh, know you you're just channeling everything. It is it's been really good. Um I, I, I think we, we talked a lot about, you know, the general public. I think just to finish it off, if you if you're okay with time. Uh good. I, I'd love to talk about more of the high achievers now. Which I think honestly most people listening to me and you and anyone that's kind of already invested some money or time into like learning the resources online to be better they're already kind of at a new stage of you know okay now i've kind of gotten through my base level of like just ignoring life and being unaware i'm more attuned um and i'm now seeking my vision my, my meaning i'm trying to you know transform things what what are maybe two or three things that these guys can do that are going to, you know, keep them focused. Cause I think focus, I just talked about in my last podcast is probably the key thing here, focus and, and belief, keeping those up along that journey for the high achievers listening. Yeah. High achievers. I think most of them know what to do. Uh, but I think there's like, there's a few things that you do, which are like the easy ones that never go wrong. Okay. And because they're so easy, we tend to forget as, as if you're a high achiever and if you're always, you know, getting the results. The one that Tony talks about where focus goes, energy flows. And the focus meaning make sure that vision, which is the end goal that you want, is in the forefront of your mind, forefront of your mind all the time. So if it's on your phone, on your laptop, you read it every day. It's on my, like my monthly plan, my weekly plan. I have my goals. Okay. So that's where the focus needs to be because if you lose the focus, the energy is being diverted elsewhere. That's one marker. I know a lot of high achievers that sometimes I'll be working with them and then it's like, you know, they have a, a shaky month and I'm like, did you go through the, did you at every, at the start and end of every week, do you go through what happened each week and what the goal is and update your, you know, your, your actual time where it's like, this is what I did, this is what I did and this led to that goal, this is leading to that goal. Oh no, I forgot, didn't have time. And then, it literally proves itself. It's that's why that week's a bit slow. So have if your vision is, you know, uh, um, uh, an office building with your star, with your vision of what it runs, that needs to be touched at least once a week, somewhere in your planning, so you know it's there. And and then like, what did I do this week that's leading to that? And analyze that. That's what keeps the goal going. Otherwise, you it's like this. Okay, so put it simple. Where focus goes, energy flows. Focus being the GPS and the target. Make sure that you're looking at the target every time. Okay. Yeah. Two would be track your time. Track everything that you do. I have a diary that I fill up at the at the start of the day and end of the day. Whether if it's wasted time, I log the wasted time. If it's used time, it's used time. If it's student, so it's divided into the seven areas of life, and I just track everything I do. So I know literally I can count predict what kind of month I'll have and what result I'll have and what's good, what goals going to happen or what goals not going to happen. Mm. Uh, so really work out, you know, where is your attention going and how are you using your time? Yeah. Um, those are the two main things I think for high achievers, because we, when we're so, when we have a lot of knowledge, or we, we do this a lot, we understand so many, like what we call tips and tricks to be, you know, good at what we do. The basics is what matter. And I follow this from Kobe, you know, Kobe talks about, I literally take the same basic shot every day, the free throw, the this, they think I can do all these things, amazing things on the court before I take that shot, I'm doing the fundamentals before I do the next. And I do that even 20 years later. So for me, it's like stick to the fundamentals. For example, um, I know that I have to do my stairs. I know I do my gym. I know I get my food in. I know I got my tracking time in. And I have like these basic things that happen as routine every single day. Like it, it's without fail. So um, that would relate to the, you know, the thing you know, we've talked about focus. We've talked about time. That, that third thing I guess to finish would be if you are able to kind of stick to one thing long enough, like the billionaire's advice is, and, and forget the short-term gratification and look at the long-term gain, it's always like guaranteed the result pretty much. Like, yeah. so keep that in mind, you know, whenever you're about to make a decision, you go, is this a short-term gratification thing or is this a long-term gain thing? And make sure that you have an answer for that before you execute all this. Yeah. So being these key tr words and thoughts that are keeping you aware about your your yep. daily actions and having the basics down pat and keeping your vision on the long term, I like it. It is very consistent with all the people I interview. Vet say 
nearly all the exact same thing. So success leaves clues, right? Of course. Yeah. I mean, I, I, there has never been a secret. There's things like what we all say. Um, I think the uh, modern world now, the main thing that would be probably the hardest to do is the attention because of all the distractions we have. So that's probably the hardest one. Now, even if you are a high achiever and you do work right, um, there are times, you know, someone might message me on even my phone because I have a work one and a, a personal one. Mm. And I try to keep the social media account separate. But there are times sometimes that, you know, I'll get a client send me a YouTube clip of something and I have to respond with something and you fall into like a few more minutes of something else. And that's with me knowing even what I'm doing. Yeah, it's so crazy, yeah. You know? They yeah, they have trained the mind to be distracted. Uh Pitner said it best. He said, you know, Instagram back in the day was you give them a twenty, you get an Instagram of drug. But that's why it's called Instagram. Because when you take the Instagram, yeah. it is the, it's the dose and you can't it's like another gram, another gram, another gram. So they they are no secrets. Like all of this stuff that is designed to distract you. And they, if they make money by how much time you spend on it, then by default everything's mm -hmm. geared to keep you on that. Food. So I think that's the hardest thing. Yeah, that's the hardest thing. So like try and win that game because that's like a daily battle. That's not like a one-off winning. Yeah. I love that. Now that it's been really awesome, Moses. Um uh last hour and a bit went really deep on, you know, a lot of things about fulfillment, consequences yeah. of living in your patterns from external worlds. Yeah. Having, you know, states that are yeah. geared towards your success and you know, finding meaning, the journey of finding meaning, long term yep. accountability. I love it. It's yep. been really good. Um, where can people listening find you? Yeah, just uh, you, you've got my social. I think you put it on the clips or something. But it's like Moses Marion's uh, same thing uh, on Instagram, Facebook's the same. Um, and that's basically it, man. I, I only run off those two things. I've just got a Twitter, um, so. Yeah. I'll be on there as well. That's probably starting this year a bit more um, because yeah. I'm planning to go to, like I said, Dubai and I've got potentially some visits to the US, but mainly just Instagram and Facebook from a work perspective, they can find yeah, it there. And there's YouTube as well, Moses Marion. Awesome. And do you have any final words for any listeners at the moment? What do you think? Yeah, I, I like the simple one. Just whatever you feel you want to do, just do it. Like And, and, it's, and speed up the time between when you say you're going to do it and when you actually do it, that's the fastest thing to success. So like if I'm, if let's say right now, me and you, you sent me a message, Hey, I'm going to do a podcast. Uh, are you good? Then I looked at the diary. This was the earliest book it at the earliest time, get it done. Just do that. Like if you, if the, the if you shorten the time between when the decision is made and when the things you need to do, if you shorten that gap in between, it, ch it changes the game. I love it. Short, sweet action. I love it. Yeah. So thanks so much, Moses. So end the recording now but um yeah i really appreciate you coming on and sharing your wisdom Anytime. everything Anytime. Yeah. thank you so much thanks for the invite appreciate it thanks sir